Hi, everyone. I'm David Free. I'm the editor in chief of College and Research Libraries News Magazine. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar that we're offering as part of ACRL's Together Wherever virtual event. Our goal for these webinars is to bring our colleagues together to discuss ways to best meet the needs of the library community during this uncertain time and beyond. As you may be aware, uh, academics are being asked to pause their teaching, research, and service activities today as part of hashtag shutdown academia and hashtag shutdown STEM. Our ACRL Together Wherever programming is being offered today in support of education and action in response to ongoing systemic anti-Black racism and Black Lives Matter. Thank you for joining us as we learn, grow, and enact change together as a community. Yeah. Oh. Sorry about that, I scrolled too much. If you'd like, feel free to type a brief introduction of yourself and say hello to all your uh, fellow attendees in the chat box. While I go over a few other little reminders, I'll also be here to monitor the chat and moderate questions at the end of the session for the presenters. Today's session is being recorded. We'll post the link to the recording um, in the, on the ACRL Together Wherever website and on our YouTube channel and social media uh, after the presentation. The ALA statement of appropriate conduct applies to all ACRL events, including virtual events, and we encourage respectful discourse about the session on Twitter using hashtag ACRLtogether2020. Today's presentation will be one hour in length, and we'll leave this room open for an additional around 20 minutes after the presentation for additional optional networking opportunities and questions with each other and the presenters. When you do choose to depart our session today, you'll see a brief evaluation and we'd greatly appreciate your thoughts and feedback. Thanks so much in advance for uh, giving us that feedback through the evaluation. Today's webcast this afternoon is Privies Pumping and Prayer, Negotiating Private Needs in Public Spaces. I'd like to thank our presenters, Jennifer Pajali, Stephanie Margolin, Emily Maras, Carissa Powell, Christina Riemann Murphy, and Holly Dean for being with us today. Presenters, feel free to start whenever you're ready, and thanks so much to everyone for attending today's session. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our panel. Um, as David already said, my name is Christina Raymond Murphy, and I'm a reference and instruction librarian at Penn State Abington. And I'll be um, both presenting a little bit, but also moderating the panel today. Um, we'd like to begin by acknowledging, as David already did, the today's shutdown academia and shutdown STEM call. While we thank you for being with us, we hope that today you prioritized the 1 p.m. President's Program with Mackenzie Mack or that you watch it later um, and that you're learning from the many anti-racism resources that are being circulated and shared via the news, social media, or through a quick Google search. If you visit shutdownstem.com, you'll find a variety of resources that are geared towards anti-racism education. For each of these topics and spaces that we're gonna talk about today, bathrooms, lactation rooms, and spiritual spaces, and particularly as they pertain to safety, security, health, and healthcare, there remain stark disparities in access to, safety in, and inclusion, particularly for people of color and for those who do not identify as white, cisgender, and heterosexual. If you're interested in any of these topics, we encourage you to center some of your research in these areas as well. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer and Stephanie, who are gonna talk about their work on bathrooms. Thank you. Um, I'm Jennifer Pajali. I'm going to kick off the section on bathrooms. I'm presenting today with my colleague and fellow bathroom enthusiast, Stephanie Margolin. Uh, and if the quote on your screen right now seems familiar, um, it's possible that you saw us in 2017 when we presented at the ACRL conference in Baltimore. Our talk there, Leading from the Lou, highlighted some of the lessons we learned after touring academic library bathrooms in the New York City area. In total, we visited bathrooms in 20 academic libraries, both public and private, as well as conducted brief email interviews with four library leaders uh, about their bathrooms. Slide, please. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna start closer, a little closer to home. Uh, these are our library bathrooms. On the left are Stephanie's, and on the right is an image from uh, my former library. It's been months since we've seen them. Uh, so take a moment to notice their government-issued banality, please. It's like they're trying not to be noticed, right? 
Unlike the places to pump and pray that our colleagues will discuss next, it might seem that bathrooms are already a universally acknowledged need on college campuses and in academic libraries. Bathrooms should not require the attention of library workers. They should be maintained by the college or university as a matter of course. But this is all too often not the case. The circulation assistants at my former library know this well. They fielded dozens of complaints from students about the bathrooms, especially during weekend and evening hours when cleaning and restocking was inadequate. We may not feel we have a lot of power with regard to our library bathrooms. We can't lay pipes or even replace toilet seats. We can't find the money needed for renovations in our shrinking budgets, even if it were appropriate for us to do so. Many times these problems are institutional and ingrained in the minds of others as unsolvable problems. But we believe there are opportunities for librarians to positively impact their, their library's bathroom facilities. It starts by taking a clear look at the problems. To help you do this, we are going to distill key themes from our library bathroom tour, as we call it, and propose a few ways to respond to them. Some of these are surprisingly easy. There are more details in our papers, as well as a few themes that we don't have time to discuss here. We're also going to raise some questions about how to make our bathrooms as safe as possible for stu as students return to campus after the COVID-19 quarantine. Slide, please. Okay, so let's start with the easiest problem to address. Where are the bathrooms? Some bathrooms are just very hard to find and some libraries provide absolutely no help. Please put up a sign, make a map, create a handout, a sticker, an app, a libguide. Put the inf information at key decision points, elevators, entrances to stairwells, at the junction of rooms or corridors. And then take a few minutes every year to make sure that the signage is still visible and accurate. And um, in this slide, you see a photo of my former library before um, uh, the renovation it underwent last year. And I'm not sure if anybody ever guessed that the bathroom was straight ahead to the left down a hallway that was marked staff only. That was the public bathroom. Uh, okay. um, why were we making people guess? Why were we creating confusion with that staff only sign? I don't know. The opposite problem than the one you see here can also arrive, uh, arise. Um, when I did the when we were doing the tour, I was in a library with so many signs about so many things that the bathroom signage was rendered invisible. Another library had a sign on the entrance floor indicating the bathroom was below, and then no sign on the lower level to help you locate it, and on and on and on. So it, it may seem obvious, but these signs are, are often overlooked and, and are important. Slide, please. Uh, users with disabilities. This is a more difficult and more crucial issue and one that requires more expertise. Are your bathrooms as accessible as they can be? The Americans with Disabilities Act has been in place for nearly 30 years and compliance with the law is fairly consistent and widespread. However, more compliance could probably, uh, mere compliance could probably be improved upon. So take a look at your signage here as well. Is it accurate and up to date? Consider the route to the bathroom. Are there tables, stools, or shelves that might make it difficult for a wheelchair user to approach it? Inside the facility, are there paper towel dispensers or hand dryers at a proper height for wheelchair users? Similarly, are there usable hooks, mirrors, or shelves for these users? The image here, um, which was from a, a library on our tour, raises a lot of questions for me. Is it safe for a disabled person to use a broken toilet seat? Is that toilet seat cover dispenser, which you can just sort of see on the left of the photo, is that at a really convenient height for someone in a wheelchair? And I think most amusingly, would anyone who menstruates find it convenient to have a sanitary napkin dispenser located behind and above a toilet in the manner of this one? Is this not more appropriately positioned for someone who stands to pee? Just a question. I'm gonna hand it over to Stephanie now and you can switch the slide, please. Accommodating transgender and gender non-conforming users is not a one-size-fits-all solution. And ideas about best practices are evolving and changing. The photos here give you some indication of the range of solutions we saw during our tour. Which of these is the right answer? As two cisgender women, we honestly do not know. The authors of Peeing in Peace 
which was published by the Transgender Law Center, recommend getting to know the interests and concerns of your own transgender and gender non-conforming community as well as that community more broadly, and educating both library workers and library users on the decisions you make and why you have made them. So any of these solutions might be appropriate. In many cases, affirming the rights of users to determine which restroom is most suitable is the most important action that library leaders can take. It puts the control in the hands of those affected. However, there are transgender and gender non-conforming users who may not feel safe and comfortable in any gendered facilities. Whatever choices your library or the broader campus makes is up to us as library leaders, faculty and staff to ensure and protect the safety and dignity of all of our users, including those who are transgender or gender non-conforming. Next slide, please. Finally, there are those Sorry. Finally, there are things that your users might need that are specific to your unique population. And this is where we really connect with the pumping and praying sections. Do you have students, faculty, or staff who bring their children to campus? If so, how many changing tables are in your bathrooms? Do you have many international students? Is your bathroom related signage in the appropriate languages? Understanding your students and their needs is crucial. And just to say, this image is not from our library tour. This is uh, Kristen Bell and LaGuardia Cross installing a changing room table in a, in a restaurant men's room. They sure make it look easy. Next slide, please. The final theme we discovered in our library tour will surprise no one, but we've separated it out here because it is stunningly, distressingly apropos in this moment. Problems with cleanliness and maintenance. And I'll give you a quick moment to take those images in. And then next slide, please. Now, moving on to the world we live in. We might be biased, but it seems to us that if we are to safely reopen our library spaces, our restrooms must be safe, clean, fully stocked, and in good working order. However, a variety of discussions about healthy, healthily reopening workplaces, including recent advice from the CDC, seem to omit discussions of safe public restrooms. We don't have any answers, but as two librarians who think a lot about bathrooms, we thought we would share some of our questions. Bear with me, we have a lot of questions. First, in the name of social distancing and shared public responsibility, do we keep bathrooms closed in order to discourage long stays in libraries or on campuses? Or do we open bathrooms in order to encourage hand washing and acknowledge the fundamental needs of bathrooms? For those restrooms with long-standing maintenance issues, which ones need to be addressed before reopening? And how can we advocate for investment in maintenance in the face of severe budget cuts? What new maintenance issues will we find with buildings that have stood empty for three or more months? How will the campus address cleaning needs? CDC calls for frequent cleaning of quote, high touch areas. They mean keyboards and phones, but what about shared flush handles, faucets and doors? How will already strained budgets and staff provide adequate cleaning? And how frequent is frequent? COVID-19 has led us to more hand washing. Does this mean more use of existing bathrooms or the installation of hand washing stations? How can restroom use be adequately socially distanced, particularly in our existing bathrooms, which were designed to be space efficient? And you can see in this slide that this bathroom is particularly narrow. Finally, there are concerns about what we are calling flushback, wastewater that flushes out of the toilet, particularly where there are no toilet lids, which was the case in virtually every bathroom we visited. Although these are not specifically library problems, we've often had to act as watchdogs or advocates for our restrooms. The complaints will come to us and surely we bear some responsibility. We need to be thinking and talking about this now. And now we're gonna pass this off to the pumping team. Hello. Thank you, Jennifer and Stephanie, Chris and Holly, you're up. Hi, I'm here with the pumping team. My name is Carissa Powell, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm excited to be here with my a uh, colleague, Holly Dean. We're going to be talking about lactation rooms, specifically one we helped build at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Uh, we are joined in spirit by our colleagues Liz Zepeda and Anna Sandelli, pictured here very excited in 2019 outside of our brand new lactation room. 
For context, our campus is about 29,000 students. We'll be sharing about the background research we did about lactation rooms in general, what we learned about these spaces on our campus, and recommendations for anyone who's thinking about creating or upgrading a space like this on their library. Next slide. Okay, so as a part of this process, one of the first things that we, um, I guess, asked ourselves is why are lactation rooms important? Um, and one of the biggest things is that everyone, um, I think especially today with our student body, we realize that employees and students are also often parents. It's not a separate um, component anymore. Um, and one of the other big issues in thinking about that is that um, there often is a big lack of access to private spaces. So. Um, even employees often don't have private offices and students certainly rarely have a private office to go to. Um, and because of this, uh, it often results in people using spaces like their personal vehicles to pump or breastfeed, um, which is not necessarily a sanitary place or an ideal place to be doing anything. Um, and because of this, uh, many people in our research reported um, stopping breastfeeding earlier than they wanted to because it just was too too much of a hassle to try to find either a safe place or a convenient place to do this. Um, next slide please. So we wanted to start out by sharing what the legal requirements are for employees for employees to provide their employers with and this was only added as a requirement in 2010. Um, as you can see here, there's not a lot of legal requirements um, and you don't even have to require that you provide a space that has a closed or locked door, as you will see in the next slide. Okay, so for um, this process of um, creating a lactation room in our library, we first kind of started with looking at what was already available on our campus. Um, and as Carissa pointed out, we are a large institution. So there were actually several options throughout campus. Um, so we took a day and we walked uh, to each one of these to see if we could find them and where they were and um, what kind of uh, resources and things they offered. Um, Pictured here are a variety of lactation rooms. Um, these are not all that were listed on the website um, for campus. Uh, and a few of them we couldn't find. Uh, they didn't exist anymore or just didn't have enough signage for us to be able to see them. Um, one of them, as stated here, was uh, in an English, was in, within the English department behind locked doors. And so I think even if it was listed as a, a public lactation room, it really was difficult to get to. You had to be there during their office hours. And because it was behind their offices, it wasn't a welcoming space to try and get to. Um, several of these were also just really difficult to find. The second image um, you see here on the left was through a bathroom. Um, and this little closet at the back did have a separate room number, so it wasn't uh, you know, in the bathroom, but because it had its own room number, it meant when you were outside walking through the building, you actually couldn't find this room number. Uh, we finally just went through the bathroom to see if we could find it, and there it was. And it was, essentially, it looks like an access room to get to pipes and other things, and they had just created that space. Um, and, you know, while we appreciate that they added that space, it was definitely not a welcoming space to get to, and I very much doubt that you could get a wheelchair in there um, to use that space. Um, some of the other spaces were just really, um, I guess, outdated. The furniture um, was not comfortable and certainly not if you were trying to pump or have an infant in your arms um, or if you needed your laptop or equipment. Um, and almost every single one of these were in bathrooms. Um, they did technically create their own space for them by putting up a partition or, um, you know, some kind of barrier, but technically you were still just in the bathroom um, sharing that space with everyone else using the restroom. One of them, that very top right corner, um, was clearly an old restroom that was converted just to a lactation space, and it was the nicest one on campus at the time, 
Um, it was very clean, it was open, but it definitely wasn't a very welcoming space. All right, next slide, please. So since we didn't have a ton of examples on campus to pull from, we put together a list of what we thought a successful lactation would include. Um, so Holly shared some great examples of what not a successful lactation room looks like. I'm only gonna touch on a couple of these. We think it's really important that there's a door and that that door locks. Very few of the ones existing on campus before 2019 had this feature, and it really contributes to the person using that space feeling safe and secure in that space. Ideally, there should be a sink with running water and that the faucet should be high up from the sink so that you can fit pumping equipment underneath it. Um, I've had friends who have to pump in one room and then walk across the library to go somewhere else to clean their equipment. So having all of that in one space is really convenient. We also think it's important that a table is near your chair and that an electrical outlet is close by. We saw some spaces where an electrical outlet was on the other side of the room and that that's not really convenient for hooking up any pumping equipment. And lastly, even though it's a legal requirement, we really feel like it's important to note that these spaces should not be in bathrooms, even if it's a closet in the bathroom. We really don't think that's an ideal situation. Next slide. Okay, so these are some additional items that are certainly not requirements if your um, budget is very limited, but things that we thought were important to consider when creating this space, um, or to think about adjustable lighting. Uh, we all know that even in our own office spaces, having ultraviolet light um, can really be tiresome after a while trying to stare at your screen and have that light is really difficult for most people, I think. Um, so making it adjustable because when you're breastfeeding or pumping um, or you just need that space with your little one, it's really important to be able to maybe dim the lights and make it a more relaxed um, atmosphere. Uh, also doing things like putting up artwork to create a welcoming atmosphere um, really can make a huge difference in the look and feel of a space. Um, and then um, the other one I want to point out here that can be particularly important, important is the white noise machine. Um, and this uh, may be dependent on where the lactation space is located. Um, it can be really crucial if it's in a noisy area. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this um, on our next slide, please. Okay, so key considerations when looking at lactation rooms. Um, as Carissa mentioned, and I mentioned a little earlier, thinking about furniture. Um, the most important thing, I think, is the chair. Um, and if anything, this is, I think, the place to kind of pour that budget if you're limited on what you can do. Um, having a chair that's not only comfortable, um, so it has armrests for a nursing parent, um, but also, thinking about um, how it can be adjustable. So, um, you know, someone like myself who's five foot two can also use it with someone else who's 5'10". Um, it can make a big difference. So maybe having a chair that has a footstool, um, maybe adjustable back or armrests. Um, and then also thinking, is it um, ADA compliant? Can a user in a wheelchair who maybe wants to transition to that chair, can they get to that easily? Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's I think, the key um, furniture-wise to think about is that chair. Um, and then thinking about um, the location is also a really important component, um, thinking about noise and accessibility. So um, like our colleagues mentioned earlier with bathrooms, can they find the lactation room? This is really important to make it a welcoming space um, by not hiding it. <laughs> um, and then also consider when you're looking at those spaces, noise. Um, so our, for our library and looking at our spaces that might be available um, to put our lactation room, um, we had one space that seemed almost perfect. It already had plumbing, it already had countertops. It was very easily accessible right off of one of our most popular um, rooms for students to use. There were actually two access points. So it was a really uh, idyllic location. 
until we realized it shared a wall with our coffee stand. And even that wall didn't quite go all the way to the ceiling. So it was incredibly noisy. Um, and there wasn't really a way to get around that. So we realized, you know, that really wasn't a good ideal space as we had thought. Um, and I'll let Carissa um, talk about our next portion of this. Yeah, in terms of campus resources, oh, sorry, I'm one slide back, sorry. Um, in terms of campus resources, we are really grateful to have a library's facilities project manager. This was actually the first project that he worked on with us. And he was our main go-to between the library and campus facilities. So they were a huge resource in terms of physically turning a consultation room into a lactation room. And they actually did put pipes in this space that did not have pipes before for a sink. Um, I also encourage folks to think about other groups on campus that could help with this kind of work. The Commission for Women on our campus actually made one of their committee priorities in 2018 looking at lactation rooms on campus. So being able to um, use that momentum was really helpful in creating our space. Next slide. So there's a few logistics I would encourage people to think about if they're thinking about creating a new, any type of room that might need to be reserved, but particularly this kind of room. Thinking about, is it gonna be locked? Is it gonna remain open? Is there gonna be a key code? Who's gonna host the key? How is it gonna be reserved? Those are a lot of things to think through. And we actually skipped that step and went straight to first come, first serve, it's always open. And just in March, just before campus closed, we were starting to have conversations about other ways of maintaining the space. So those are a lot of things to think about. Um, Holly's already touched on accessibility in a few different ways, but making sure that also everything in the room is ADA compliant. So the chair, the sink, the door, there were several spaces in our library that were disqualified from becoming a lactation room because it would be difficult to make those things. And those things are very important for pe people using the space. In terms of inclusion, as a working group, we spent a lot of time being intentional about who we wanted the intended users to be in this space and how we wanted them to feel welcome and comfortable. Um, we felt that this room needed to be inclusive of all genders and that's not really traditional for a lot of lactation spaces. Um, when we were doing our research, we found a lot on other campuses that were called mother's rooms or the nursing room. And so just being intentional about something like a name can go a long way in feeling included in that space. Um, I also really encourage folks to be intentional about what's inside the room. For example, with artwork, the working group was consulted about which artwork was gonna go up on the walls. And the first round of options was all white women and their children from our archives. And we were immediately just like, that is not gonna work. That is not what we want up on the walls. And so just having those kinds of conversations and checking back in throughout the process to make sure that the final product is something that you can be proud of. Next slide. This is a reading list that is included in the LibGuide and we're looking forward to chatting more about lactation rooms in the Q&A. Next slide. Thank you, Carissa and Holly. Um, this is Christina again and Emily Maross and I, um, who are librarians at the Penn State Commonwealth campuses, are gonna be talking to you about the prayer portion of this panel today. Um, Emily is the business librarian at the Harrisburg campus and for the past four years we've been researching spiritual spaces in libraries after some initial observations at our own campuses. We began our research by doing a large-scale national survey of academic library professionals to investigate if what we were observing at our own campuses was unique or if it was happening at other academic libraries as well. Our key finding was that this is happening across the country at a range of institutions with a variety of characteristics. Library professionals are observing students using spaces for prayer and spiritual activities, and that academic libraries are also accommodating these student needs, either passively by just allowing them to happen, um, or actively by creating spaces or directly interacting with students to support their spiritual needs. 
after we cleaned the data, we had 584 responses from 44 states, including the District of Columbia. You can see the other um, results of who responded to this. 57% were from public colleges and universities, 43% were from private, and of those private, 56% were religiously affiliated. And if you were one of those people that participated in that survey, we want to thank you very much because we had just a wonderful participation rate. Um, and you can see on the left, so half of those respondents reported observing students using space in the library for prayer, and half also pr reported providing a prayer space. When we looked closer at the data, particularly at what type of institutions the library professionals were representing, the numbers still stayed consistent. 50% of library professionals at public institutions reported students using library space for prayer, and 52% of the campuses that had chapels or spiritual centers on their campuses still reported students praying in the library. As to where library employees reported them praying, you can see at the bottom, 53% in study rooms, 58% in the book stacks, and the rest were in classrooms, formal prayer spaces, stairways, or halls. After completing the study, we decided to take a closer look at Penn State, since it is a very large public institution with many campuses. And beyond what we were aware of at our own campuses, which for the Abington campus is just students using the stacks and study rooms near the restroom. That's the picture in the upper right-hand corner. Um, there are actually a variety of spiritual prayer and meditation spaces, some in the library and some external to it across Penn State. So here are some photos of various spaces, including the Pescarilla Center at University Park, chapels, spiritual centers, and prayer rooms at the Altoona, Erie, Harrisburg, and Hazleton campuses. There's a labyrinth at Penn State Berks, and there are spaces in libraries at both the Hazleton campus and the law library. And so we decided that our next logical step in research was to conduct some focus groups at a few of Penn State campuses to make sure our research included student voices about where they prayed and why they prayed, where they did, and whether they felt welcome doing so, which Emily is going to be talking about next. Thanks, Christina. Uh, so on this slide, you're seeing the demographics of the students who participated in our focus groups. Um, I will say that not all of the groups were equally balanced in number. Um, one was not truly a group. It was more a conversation. Only one person ended, showing, ended up showing up. Um, but we did have one that was more than 10 people. So it really just kind of varied depending on the day. Um, and then on the uh, left side of the screen are the main themes that came across from each focus group. Um, so we were in four different campus contexts, uh, but these themes came up for each group um, without any prompting from us, which was really um, interesting to see. So our focus groups uh, had uh, Muslim and Christian students as most represented. Um, and this may have been because uh, the primary re uh, way that we did our recruiting was to reach out to the campus religious groups. So we did have a multiple um, numbers of faiths represented there. Um, but for some of the smaller uh, groups, there may have only been one person that came as opposed to the larger groups that sent a lot of people. Um, so as I mentioned, as our, though our groups took place on four different campuses with different community contexts, the overall themes that emerged about what makes a space preferable for spiritual activities or prayer were very common. Um, and I'm gonna share some direct quotes on our later slides that will illustrate these themes um, a little bit more. Uh, what I think is really interesting is that listening to our colleagues talking about bathrooms and pumping uh, spaces, a lot of these themes are actually very similar. <laughs> um, so first and foremost, uh, students wanted a space that was convenient. Um, so even if you create the most beautiful space, uh, if it's not convenient for them to get to or to use, uh, they're just going to use what is most convenient to them. Um, and that related to that is having that space be reservable. Um, so this means two things. Uh, both that students can book the space so that they know that they'll have it available when they need it, um, such as if they want a Bible study group or if they're doing Friday prayers if they're Muslims. Um, but it also means that the space should be easily reservable. Um, on more than one campus, our students uh, complained that they had to use antiquated processes. They couldn't uh, reserve things for a standing date. So Friday prayers take place every Friday. If you can't you know, book a space every Friday or have to do it every single week, that becomes um, pretty challenging. Um, and they might also get bumped out of that space, that space for a different group. Um, students really wanted some privacy in that space so that they wouldn't be stared at or questioned for what they were doing. Um, and they all really seemed to want have, to have some space to show, uh, store their materials, like a prayer mat, a text, or something like that, um, so they wouldn't have to haul them in and out every time they had a group meeting um, or just wanted to pray and reflect quietly on uh, their spiritual text for that time. 
one big thing that was also really important for uh, Muslim students was to have an adequate and private washing facility that was either nearby or within whichever space they were using to pray. Next slide. So this slide has our focus group questions, which you can access on the guide. I've shared that link there. I'll drop it in again for anybody else that's uh, joined us. Um, but we had six questions with a number of different probes. And primarily, we wanted to ask where students were praying on campus generally, um, if they felt comfortable praying on campus in the spaces that they chose, if they prayed in the library. Some libraries did have a prayer space or at least a space that could be used for prayer. Um, others didn't. And then finally, we asked the students what their ideal prayer space would look like. Um, so you can examine these questions in a little bit more detail on our uh, guide if you would like. Um, next slide, please. So we have a series of three different quote sets. Um, this first set is kind of about the privacy and convenience or lack thereof in these spaces. Uh, so we really wanted to highlight our students' voices here. Um, if you notice spiritual pr practices in your library, we really encourage you to learn all you can um, from your students in this area because it's different for everyone, um, but there's definitely going to be commonalities. So these two quotes were from different campuses, um, but uh, kind of getting to the same issue, you know, you don't want people staring at you. I just want to do something private for myself and I need a little bit of space to do that. Um, and also if the study rooms are constantly booked and I keep getting bumped, I don't have a place to pray that is somewhat private. Next slide. So just having a space uh, was very meaningful to students. Um, and that's really what came out when we asked them about their ideal space. Um, we you know, let them say, the sky's the limit. Whatever you would want to be there could be there. Um, and really, they just wanted a space where they could have some private prayer, but also a space where people could pray together. Um, it was really very simple. Um, so uh, this is one student who was previously at my campus. Um, where we have a standalone spiritual center, but that only exists because we were able to create a new building. Um, before that, this was the prayer space in our library, which also was hidden and you could not find on a website. <laughs> uh, we do have some signage, but you had to know where it was to actually be able to get there. Um, so the students on a new campus without that prayer space and they just use a room in the library because it's available. Next slide. And then finally, these are some quotes about why these students choose to pray at the library. Um, so in support of using the library spaces, even if a formal space for spiritual activity cannot be created, um, students thought that what we do in the library and just what libraries in general provide is helpful to them um, to conduct their spiritual uh, practices. So we do have study rooms that have a little bit of privacy. Um, you know, people feel welcome at the library and safe there to use it. Um, and sometimes generally it's quiet um, so they can think about uh, their spiritual practice uh, while they are in the library. Next slide please. So our final slide uh, related to prayer before we get into our moderated questions. These are just some of the things that we would encourage you to think about if you have a space in your library, you're thinking about making a space. Um, so if you're interested in becoming more active in supporting your students who may pray or conduct spiritual activities in your library spaces, we recommend that you respectfully observe what practices are taking place and which spaces are most commonly used. Reach out to the users and also campus religious constituencies to hold focus groups about their needs and preferences. Uh, this is an excellent way to start building partnerships with these groups as well as the Office of Student Life or Student Affairs. Um, on our campus, actually, when we had these focus groups, we had students of the same religion learning from each other about issues that they each faced in using these spaces that they weren't aware of. So it was really great, not just for us to learn, but for them to learn from each other. Then if you're able, um, try to provide materials like religious texts or prayer mats, which can be easily removed and stored when not in use. Uh, similarly, you may adapt spaces to be flexible for spiritual practice or adapt your policies to allow for more liberal use of library spaces. Employee training and awareness is key in any solution that you'll choose. Uh, so be sure that staff know that prayer is acceptable. If a student is not disturbing or disrupting anyone with their spiritual practice, it should not be interrupted or questioned. And if you're able to create or repurpose library space into a spiritual space, be sure to include adequate signage identifying the space, its purpose, and acceptable uses. Also, it might be helpful if students um, have such spaces identified on campus maps or wayfinding guides on your website so that they don't have to ask for permission or help in locating that space and they can do that independently. Um, and that's one big challenge that we found. It's kind of something that you had to know about already or find out from word of mouth to know that some of these spaces existed. Um, and one other thing that we came up with after our lactation colleagues mentioned that 
um, be mindful of any images you might place in uh, a space like that. Um, so if you're going to do something, maybe patterns or nature designs, um, no depictions of people um, so that you're being inclusive of all types of religions that might use that space. Uh, so that is uh, it for prayer and we can move on. Thank you to all of our panelists um, for giving a solid background on your work. Uh, now I'm going to switch to moderator role and I'm going to ask the panelists to address some common themes and questions that come up around bathrooms, lactation rooms, and spiritual spaces. Um, and I'm just going to actually address a few of these things in the interest of time and because we want to make sure that we answer um, whatever questions we can from the audience. Um, so the first question um, to the panelists is, and some of you kind of mentioned that this is sort of outside the realm of sort of traditional librarian research or work. Um, but how did you as librarians come to an awareness of others private needs in these areas. Uh, I think I'm answering that first. <laughs> this is Stephanie and we're talking about bathrooms and in bathrooms, I guess it's possibly a little different than the other two. We were aware of our own needs right away. And um, Jennifer and I were both struck as we started this project with the inequities between bathrooms that we saw at administrative offices within our university versus bathrooms that we saw in our own campus libraries. Um, we saw taking on this project as an opportunity to do something positive for the students, or at least that's what we believed when we were first starting. I don't know that we still uh, feel that we were effective in that way. And we also found it a little bit subversive. Uh, bathrooms are things that we might discuss amongst ourselves, but we tend not to talk about in important meetings or academic conferences. Therefore, bathrooms are not in the library literature, even literature that's about spaces or renovations tend not to include bathrooms. So that was sort of how we came to our project. Okay, this is Holly um, talking about um, pumping or our lactation spaces. Um, and really this came about because our colleague Liz um, came up to us and said, hey guys, I'm thinking about having a baby and I realized that we don't have this space for employees. And um, so that got us kind of thinking um, about, you know, what our options were. And so Liz said, hey, can we look into this? Let's, you know, let's do some research. Um, which of course as librarians, we got excited about. Um, and so really it was just, we started looking around what, at our campus and looking at research. Um, and at the same time, um, Carissa came across um, a Twitter thread that was discussing this exact topic across uh, academic institutions. So we kind of realized besides our personal uh, needs and desires that this was something that a lot of places were talking about and that it um, was a very um, you know, prominent um, uh, thing that people were thinking about now. Um, so with regards to prayer, uh, this is Emily. I worked at a community college prior to coming to Penn State um, and in that space was asked to provide a space in the library for students to pray. Um, and then when I came to Harrisburg, I learned that we actually did have a prayer space already in the library that was created in much the same way. Um, administration came to the library and asked if we could provide the space. Um, I met Christina very early in my uh, tenure at Penn State and at her library, students were just using those open stacks. So that was one of the pictures that were included there. Um, in the earlier slides and we got to talking and just kind of noticed over time that a lot of people were mentioning, oh, hey, at my library, the students are playing in X, Y, or Z space. Um, so we really wanted to examine this a little bit more um, and hope to provide um, kind of a better experience for students um, by understanding their needs better so that we could respond to them in a respectful way. Thank you. Um, and so the next question then is, so how did you navigate the logistics of either starting or advancing these projects? Were there any particular partnerships or collaborations or even challenges um, that you'd want to share with us? Hi, this is Holly again, um, regards to pumping. Um, we really, after Liz came to us, um, decided to uh, go talk to our associate dean, who at the time was all of our supervisors. Um, and so we just mentioned this idea to her and asked for permission to look into this. Um, and really, I would say the biggest reason that we had success on this project is that we not only conducted that research, but we put together a report to present to the dean and present to um, facilities showing, you know, all the, all the needs, all the desires and um, the ideal ways to do this and even suggestions of where we could do it in our library. Um, so we really just tried to think of every possible way for them not to be able to say no to us. 
Um, and as Carissa mentioned earlier, a fairly new position at that library um, was very specifically for a facilities person to the library. And so we were able to work with him um, and he was able to pull in a lot of other um, campus partnerships. Um, and in the end, actually campus facilities picked up the project because they felt it had been such an important um, piece. Um, so our project uh, working on prayer spaces, when we started to gather data, we were able to get a research grant from the University Libraries at Penn State, um, which really provided the basis for us to um, do data analysis, to do these focus groups, um, and kind of start building some partnerships with different organizations on campus. Um, and it's been really great every time that we've presented, we get more people coming up to us telling us the stories of what's going on on that campus. Um, so that's been really helpful. And the last question I'm going to ask us um, in the interest of letting our audience ask us questions is why do we have to make space for these things now? We never had to worry that, about them before, or at least the collective we or the majority we didn't have to. This is Carissa. I'm from the pumping group. Um, just looking at from a legal standpoint, this was only started to be required 10 years ago. And that's not like in the history of academic libraries 10 years ago is not a lot. Um, so I think since then, our library just made accommodations on a first, like on a need to basis. Um, I also think gender plays a role with lactation rooms. It was an all woman group that worked to get this done. And I think sometimes it's easy for projects like that to kind of get pushed back on. No one in our library was surprised that we asked for it. They were they were all like, oh yeah, we've been talking about that. And so it really, it was not a new topic to them. Um, so those are some of my thoughts and I'm happy that it got pushed through. I think that the fact that so many students on campus don't have a space like this, that it's really important to have them in places like libraries. Um, so in regards to prayer space, uh, we are having an increasingly diverse population on our campuses across the country. Um, and so there are people who are also coming from uh, diverse religious backgrounds that want to or wish to um, practice uh, their religion, um, which might require more prayer throughout the day. Uh, we also have that increased um, focus on mindfulness that can actually just even go beyond religion to have a quiet place to meditate and reflect. Um, and a prayer space or a spiritual space also accommodates those needs. Um, and additionally, when we're thinking about places where and campuses where students are largely commuter, um, they don't have a dorm room to go back to. They don't really have any type of private space where they can just have a quiet moment. Um, and having a spiritual space provides that. Um, that need. Okay, and this is Jennifer again from the bathroom group. Um, I think with uh, the, the questions maybe seems a little strange for bathrooms, like why do we have to worry about this now? Because um, from the perspective of today, it might be that you consider all bathroom, uh, that bathrooms have always been available. But um, I think here it's, it's important to think about access uh, and what access to bathrooms for people um, who maybe don't feel comfortable using the bathrooms as, as they are provided. Um, so just a little historical context from a non-historian who's read a lot about bathrooms. Um, uh, like 150 years ago in the US and um, in other Western countries, there were no public bathrooms men uh, who needed to use the bathroom could step into a bar or public house or they could pee in the street. Women had no options and this really limited uh, the amount of movement that women could do in the world and the kinds of ways that they could behave in the world. Similarly in the US, Jim Crow laws, as we should all be aware of, especially um, today, we should be thinking about this, um, meant that um, Black people could only use certain bathrooms and kept them out of certain spaces and made them feel less uh, comfortable in those spaces, less welcome. So I think paying attention to that history can help you think about what our bathrooms are doing to people now and whether those are creating um, similar limitations to people uh, transgender people, gender non-conforming people, for example, who want to move around in the world the same way that, that uh, cisgender people do. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, now I want to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, 
and we want also want to thank you for attending today, but we also want to point you to a lib, guide, a lib guide that Emily created for us where you can download our slides. You can find some of the additional readings um, that Carissa and Holly put along with additional readings for um, all of our projects, and you can find our presenter information. So David, could you let us know if we've gotten any questions in the chat? We did have some questions in the chat and I'll go through these. We can, I think we can stay in the room a little after the top of the hour so we can get through these. Um, I'll just kind of start where I think they started. Uh, in the from a question from the lactation section, um, kind of just discussed a little bit in the chat and answer to this, but uh, how about cleaning up, how about cleaning supplies for spills, et cetera? How do you deal with that in a, uh, or provide those things in the lactation room setting? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. It was actually super controversial. Our campus was going through the process of taking paper towels out of every bathroom on campus. And we had special permission to have a paper towel dispenser in our lactation room. That was like a major win. Um, we also provide Clorox wipes um, and the bathroom or the lactation room is on the cleaning rotation for that floor every single day. Okay, great. Now we had another, um, there was another question after that one, obviously these are in the order of the presentations uh, related to the lactation section. Do you have suggestions to deal with non-lactating people who co-opt the space for studying, sleeping, eating? Uh, the, com the questioner also commented, we also had some students using our lactation room for praying, even though we have a separate dedicated space for meditation or prayer. Yeah, this was just becoming an issue at the very beginning of March. And so we were starting to have these conversations and it'll probably look really different when we reopen in the fall. Um, Philosophically, I was really excited about keeping the room open, that there wasn't an access issue to getting a key or a code. Um, but ultimately, the space is for people who need to express milk. And so we are looking into having a reservation system and a key or code. I just want to jump in there real quick, um, only to say that one of the reasons why we ended up sort of finding Chris and Holly for this was that, um, and Jennifer and Stephanie was that obviously bathrooms came up in its relation to prayer spaces, but also whoever asked that question, it was not uncommon um, to find that lactation spaces were doubling as prayer spaces, either intentionally or just that's how people were using them. So we had one campus actually at Penn State that the lactation room and also the prayer space, that's what it was designated for. So that's a good question and not uncommon. And a follow, more general kind of follow-up to that question. Uh, what, about what about students who do just need to take a nap? Um, Have you, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, for prayer spaces, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Uh, we haven't really encountered too many areas where we actually do have a designated prayer space that's open all the time. So in my library now, it's um, study rooms. Uh, the previous library prayer space would not be a place where you would want to take a nap. It was literally a prayer mat on a very hard floor. <laughs> um, so um, I would just say, you know, that's kind of an issue where you need your users to kind of um, work things out together. Um, if they're not disturbing people and it's not a one person use at a time, you can kind of try to negotiate it that way. Um, I know a lot of other libraries have issues about sleeping in the library just because it's a safety issue. You don't know someone's having a health issue and um, there's some pushback about napping in libraries just generally on that. Um, but also I would mention that at University of Tennessee Knoxville, they do have a meditation space and we've previously presented with um, Anna Sandelli, who was mentioned at the top. Um, and they have some interest, not, Anna's not here to speak to that, but they, <laughs> they had some interesting um, ways of kind of helping to um, support and control that space that um, might be able to help flesh that out. Great, from the, uh, from the prayer perspective, uh, could you comment or talk a little bit about how you took into account the different um, different religions, different religious and spiritual practices when creating a prayer space? And was that accessible, something that's accessible um, for people of all uh, faiths or spiritual practices to be able to share equally and equitably? Yeah, 
Sure. Um, so on the guide, we actually do have a number of different resources that talk about creating an interfaith space. Um, and so truly uh, keeping things as simple as possible is the way to make that happen. Um, so you really don't want like fixed seating. You want things that can be moved around because some um, practices will be kneeling or sitting on the floor um, as opposed to sitting in a chair. Um, keeping things uh, simple on the walls, not having pictures of people. If you'd like to kind of include images there, make sure that they're nature, patterns, designs, things like that um, that are just very neutral. Um, and then if you'd like to include a variety of different texts, you can do that. Um, but really it comes down to um, having a space that's flexible, a place for people to sit down um, and, and also take their shoes off if that's what they do during, during their practice, a place to put your shoes if you take your shoes off during your practice, um, and a mat to use if things are gonna be on the floor. And then related to that, making sure that the floor is cleaned regularly so that if people are on the floor, it's not gross. Um, but we do have more information on the guide, but it really is not very complicated to create um, a flexible interfaith space that people can use for kind of drop-in spiritual practices. And Duke University, they've created both a meditation space and a prayer space. They have some really good policies that they share online. Um, and I'd say that that brings up why we talk about holding focus groups and the importance of that. It was both Emily and I, our first time ever running focus groups, but it was really rewarding. Um, we recruited from the various um, campus religious groups or spiritual groups. Um, and that was helpful because it became a true focus group where students were really learning from each other and talking to each other. And in general, one of the big takeaways from the focus groups was that students wanted it to be a space that everybody could use. They wanted it to be accommodating and flexible. Um, and it really was actually really interesting for us to watch them learn from each other about what they needed um, for their prayer or spiritual practices. So focus groups at your campus with your particular populations are a really important part of that. And somewhat related, um, have any of you panelists in the in the prayer or any, what, any of you in general ever examined um, what type of facilities are typically provided at libraries in majority Muslim countries? or other different faiths, have you looked at, or in any of those practices, have you looked outside the US at what um, examples or other libraries in other countries are doing in these areas? Um, we haven't really because our focus was very much specifically on United States universities. Um, that's a good idea for us to uh, look outside. I guess the one consideration that I think is pretty different for um, most places in the US as compared to a Muslim majority country um, in a Muslim majority country, your schedules are usually going to be uh, kind of going around the different calls to prayer because that's part of everyday life. Whereas in the US, we're not. And so students are having to fit in prayers on a traditional US academic schedule that doesn't make space for that, um, which is why the convenience of the space is very important to them because their schedule goes on like their prayer schedule is not there. Anyone else examined, like even from different perspectives of the different types of, of uses and rooms from any international perspectives? Are these primarily U.S. kind of um, trends or are they more in a trends in the global library world? Um, so some of the literature that we found in the last few months, um, we found some a few different studies from the United Kingdom. Um, and also some from some Scandinavian countries that are looking at different prayer things. But this is not something that is being very widely published about in the scholarly literature. So um, we might, we need probably need to dig into kind of more um, popular literature to learn a bit, a little bit more about that. But this is not something that is very commonly um, discussed too much in the scholarly literature, and certainly not in the library literature. Yeah. Um, for prayer, another for prayer space question, have, have you had a discussion of how library staff, especially those who don't have private offices, would perhaps benefit from a uh, prayer meditation space within their library? Um, so again, that's a little bit outside of the scope of what we've been examining, but it is a good idea. And I will say that, that the focus on mindfulness for kind of the larger um, group of people that use libraries, so faculty, staff, student workers included, um, that focus on mindfulness has become kind of one of our pathways into the literature because there is more literature that exists on kind of mindfulness and meditation in the workplace, um, more so than just prayer. Uh, so we haven't examined that, but it is literature that we've evaluated um, because it is tangentially related and it is a way for us to tie into the current scholarly conversation. Yeah, those are the main, oh, we have a couple other questions that came in here and at the end in the chat, I'm just looking at, um, for all gender bathrooms, do those uh, tend to be able to be locked by users or are they more open spaces? 
Yes, the, the all gender bathrooms that we saw on our tour were primarily single user bathrooms. And so then you were able to, to lock those. Yeah, we actually saw one multi-user all gender restroom. And I think um, the, the slide does include a photo of the signage around that one. And that was a multi-user all gender bathroom. Um, so uh, there was a two stalls in one of those bathrooms and a stall and a urinal in the other. I think this might be the last question that um, Chris, I spoke to you a little bit in the presentation, but I'm going to speak a little more to you. If you had students um, using any varieties of the private rooms for, um, for amorous behavior, um, you know, policies, or how do you deal with that if those um, things happen or if there are complaints about that? Amorous behavior is the best way of putting it. Thank you. I'm going to use that. In that the was the question. Or, uh, I wish I could take credit for that, but uh, Diane, who asked the question, um, used that yeah. language. <laughs> that was that was the, the issue we were having. And because pre-COVID-19, our library was open 24-5. Um, so that is what's kind of prompting us to look into having the space on a reservation system or a key or a code. Um, we did receive complaints, which is how we found out about it. Oh, and there's, there's one more. Um, if you thought of, if anyone kind of examined or looked at incorporating kind of, uh, I, know, I can, the, the questioner can clarify this if they, if they wish, incorporating spiritual therapy in the library. I guess I'm, I'm going to say maybe like meditation practice or something might be at, at what they're getting at in that question, but please feel free to um, clarify that if the questioner wishes in the chat. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Um, spiritual therapy, if that's the term, that isn't something that we've examined. Um, at my campus, we do have a meditation group that meets weekly, um, but they don't actually meet in the library and it's mostly faculty and staff that participated uh, in that, not really students. Um, and they, it's, they meet as a large group. So the spaces that we have in our library where students pray would not be um, applicable to the size of that group. <laughs> hey, thank you so much. I think that was um, all of the questions that we had in the chat. Uh, Lauren, did, would you like to close us out? Yes, thank you so much everyone for being here today. We're going to stop the recording now.